Good morning, hardy folk. Good morning. <laughs> How could we not want to come out? The sun is shining, a little bit of blowing, and the big storm is down south. Anyway, welcome to Port Elgin United Church. We are blessed to be here today to have warm homes, to have vehicles or transportation that gets us here safely. And I'm just so thankful that uh, you have crawled out of bed, uh, put on warm clothes and come into this warm place today. And if you are visiting, we are really delighted that you are visiting, and we hope that you will enjoy your time today. Feel the presence of God in what we do here at Port Elgin United Church, and make this your spiritual home. Today, we're going to be talking about a wedding. And uh, I think probably, is there anybody here who hasn't been at a wedding? All right. Sometime in our lives, we go to a time where there is great celebration, and today we are going to get a view from the wedding at Cana. And I hope that, as I know, as I've been thinking about this, um, so many different emotions happen at a wedding, and, and when we know the Lord, so many different emotions also arise in us. So we look forward to an opportunity to think more about the wedding at Cana and how God comes into our lives in a wonderful and amazing ways. The men's breakfast has just taken place, so if you can smell bacon, it's not me, but it might be the person who is sitting next to you. So I'm, I know that it was a great time. If you are visiting today, we hope that you will make the opportunity to sign the guest book outside in the welcome area. And if you have children with you, after our time in the sanctuary with our children, they are invited to go with our Discovery Cove teachers and uh, to take part in some interesting times together. And then following worship today, of course, there is uh, some refreshment in the activity center, and we hope everyone will stay for that. We acknowledge the land on which we gather this morning, the traditional territories of the Ojibwe and other peoples who preceded them. We acknowledge their history, their spirituality, and their culture. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples, one based on honor and deep respect. Let us enter into a time of silence, putting aside our concerns and cares, opening ourselves this day to God's presence. light of the world. May we hear God's word opening our hearts and minds and responding to God's love with our prayers, our praise, and our very lives. Let us worship together. And Gabriel is going to come and help with the lighting of the Christ candle this morning. And Gabriel's almost to the point you don't even need the ladder anymore. And as we light the Christ candle, may the God we know through Jesus Christ be present among us and within us as we gather together today. Good, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gabriel. 
I invite you to join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. God, you invite everyone. You bless all, those who are generous and giving, those who struggle with sharing. You know our abilities and our challenges, our yearnings and needs. In this time of worship, may our awareness of your goodness and grace give us reason to rejoice as guests at a wedding, happily receiving your love and blessing. This we pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us stand and sing together, We Are One. Invite the children to come forward now if they would like to. Do you like it so cold? Yeah? Do you still bundle up and go outside and play and have a good time? Yes, I think that's really important to do that, just to get some of that great fresh air. Now, I am wondering if. Any of you have ever been at a wedding? I'll just hold it till after Gabriel, okay? Have any of you actually? I know you've been at a wedding, haven't you? Because you were the flower girls at a wedding. Yeah, that was really, really nice. Come on up to the front. Would you like to sit with the other kids for a couple of minutes? Yeah, it's nice to have you here. And um, so what are some of the things that people do when there's a wedding? Or what maybe are some of the things that you had to do when there was a wedding? Mm -hmm. You had to be a flower girl, right? And you were awesome. Aiden? Not disturb the wedding. Now, why would you say that? Yes, okay, so you might have special shoes. Does anybody get special shoes for special occasions? Yeah? And you might have a, a hat. You might have a very special hat that you wear. You might have, now, I might need a, a, somebody a little bit older. A fascinator. 
we were at a wedding a while ago and all kinds of people wore fascinators. And you might wear gloves and you might wear extra jewelry just to really, really look special, right? Um, you might have a shawl or some sort of special jacket. And then, of course, you might take a gift or a card, right? So there are all these things that we do to prepare ourselves to go to something very special like a wedding. In the Bible, in the Gospel of John, there is a story about a very special wedding. And it wasn't a wedding in the community in which Jesus was, but it was a wedding a little bit further away in a place called Cana. Now, at this wedding, something really unusual happened. People were eating. Is that unusual to do at a wedding? Or when you're with friends in a party or something? No, it's not. And people were drinking. And is that something unusual when we get together with other people to want to share maybe a pop or something like that? But guess what happened? Somebody went to the fridge and they opened the fridge because everybody was still thirsty and there wasn't anything else to drink. Not a thing. How do you think the guest, if you were a guest at a wedding like that, how would you feel? Would you be maybe a little bit angry or a little bit worried? Particularly if you were dancing and you were really, really thirsty. Well, something very amazing happened that day. And in the Gospel of John, it tells us that Jesus did something very special because there were jugs of water. And Jesus did something to that water to change it into a very special drink. And then there was lots of wine for everybody. There was lots to drink for everybody. Now we can think of this story and think, hmm, I wonder what it, that means for us. And I'm going to be talking more to the adults about that when you go to Discovery Cove. Aiden. Why they didn't just drink the water. Now there's a good idea. You know why? Part of it was because the water at that time wasn't pure. And so to drink to, they mixed it, usually two parts of water to one part wine, so that it was pure. It, was, it didn't make them sick. That's a really, really good question because, you know, today we drink all kinds of water. We bring water everywhere we go. We, even in our school classes, we take water. So something really, really special happened. But the thing was that Jesus didn't make that special thing happen just to say, look at me, I'm the good guy. Jesus did made something special happen to help the people understand that God loves them so much and can transform them, can make them different, can love them so much. And that there is always love, always, always, always enough for everybody, absolutely everybody. And I think that's something that we need to remember. Sometimes when things aren't going our way, when we're a little bit frustrated, or maybe the kids on the playground or at nursery school don't want to play with us, and we feel a little bit sad. We can always remember that God is there, that God is there giving us the very, very best, and that we can be the very best with God's help. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Absolutely a wonderful thing to know. So let's have a little prayer before you go to Discovery Cove. And uh, then the adults are going to sing a song. You'll know the tune. The words might not be quite familiar, but you'll know the tune. So can we have a repeat after me prayer? Yes? Okay. Dear God, thank you for stories in the Bible that remind us that you love us and there is enough love for everyone help me to share your love with everyone else amen all right thank you so much for sharing with us and uh, let's sing our song for after the children's time and go and have fun at discovery cove okay
We are offered an opportunity to open ourselves to God for giving grace as we offer a prayer of confession. Let us share in these words together. Deep within us, God, we know there are truths evident only to us and to you. Some of those truths capture hopes and dreams that are unrealized. Other truths embody pain and hardships unrevealed to others. You entrust us with your good news and the promise of forgiveness and transformation. Hear now as we offer our personal prayers of confession in a time of silence. We are offered God's forgiving love. May the light of peace and hope fill our lives this day and always. We are free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing together, Come Touch Our Hearts. Please be seated. And our scripture this morning will be shared by Bob Hunter. Our scriptures this morning come from 
the Old Testament book of Isaiah and New Testament Gospel of John. Both refer to weddings and the unity and surprises that often occur. Let us pray. Holy God, by your Spirit, may these ancient stories and words come alive for us. May we recognize in them both our own selves and those we encounter each and every day. Open us to your will for our lives through the stories of those who lived long ago. Amen. Our first reading from the book of Isaiah expresses the prophet's commitment to pray continually for the people of Israel. Isaiah anticipates a new name for Jerusalem, a new name that announces new hope founded in trust in God. We read from Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 to 5, found on page 1159 of the Pew Bible. Zion's new name. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hebzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a maiden, so will your sons marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. The second reading is from John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, found on page 1648. Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Thanks be to God for this reading. It is so good to be back in Nazareth. It is just so good to be back in Nazareth. I've been at a lot of weddings in my day. I've been at big weddings, at small weddings, at weddings where, well, the people are so deeply in love, they wouldn't care whether anybody else was around. And then I've been at those weddings that seem to be arranged by parents who just can't wait for their children to get married. They almost need to have their children married off. Now, when the invitation came, I had to rearrange my whole schedule. After all, a a wedding isn't just one day. A wedding is a whole week, seven days of celebration. Celebration. It's a week, and that doesn't even count the advanced setting of the bride and the groom with the parties and the gatherings that there are. 
the time to get ready all of the wonderful things that need to be prepared. You know, we, we don't party much like we used to. Um, there's just so much going on in our lives these days. Our, our taxes are going up, food is going up, and there's sometimes a little bit of fear about gathering together. So, you know, when we do have a party, when there's a wedding, everybody's invited and everybody comes. And yes, sometimes it means that we have to share our food or share other things, but it's a party. We get together and we celebrate. Oh, but this was going to be a bit of a problem because Cana is nine miles away from where we live and transportation is a problem. Uber camel just doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, we made the plans and it was my very first destination wedding. It was a wedding. All weddings are on Wednesday. And a lovely affair. The gardens were adorned with all kinds of flowers and sheaths for good luck. The tables with candles and sprigs of flowers and encircled a floor that was going to be for dancing. And the canopy, a wedding canopy, which it has to have, was put at the side and it was adorned with flowers too. And we knew that when the time came for the bride and the groom to be married, to exchange their vows, that the canopy would be over their heads, signifying the love of God that would carry them forth from this special day. And the wedding guests, well, my goodness, the wedding guests, you know, usually we wear really ordinary clothes, browns and grays, much like the soil that is around us. And they're easier to keep clean that way. But somehow people wore reds and blues and greens and it was like, what happens when the flowers bloom in the desert? And it was beautiful. The groom arrived, his robes had been embroidered by his grandmothers and his aunts. And he looked very regal. And when the bride arrived, there was a gasp. She too was dressed in a beautiful gown, completely embroidered, with color similar to that of her groom. Her hair was braided and on top a floral wreath. It was so very, very beautiful. And I'm told that the shawl that she wore was one of the ones that her mother wore at her wedding too. And then, after the wedding, I was in the throng as it followed the bride and the groom through the streets of the town. No, they didn't leave in a caravan or, or escape to Jerusalem. They headed off to their new home. You know, this is one of the wonderful things, I think, about a, a wedding in the size of a, of a place like Cana is that everybody joins and we go along the streets, but the leaders take us along the longest route to where the bride and groom are going to live. And so as we went along and there was cheering and laughing and songs and singings and we were praising God for this wonderful union. People who didn't know the bride and groom would press into the groom's hand a coin or a token of good luck. And then when we finally arrived at their new home, well, I guess it's all right for a starter home. When we arrived at the home, the bride and groom opened the doors and the windows and we went in and we celebrated. And now for these next days, they will be called king and queen. And people will take them food and drink, and there'll be all kinds of celebrations for the next week. Food and drink. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to tell you about. Because it was a wedding with a difference. It began like almost every other wedding. As I told you, beautiful setting, a beautiful place to gather. The food was laid out. There were spicy foods and salty foods. There were all kinds of fruits, grapes and figs that just shone with the glistening of the season. Beautiful trays of breads of all kinds, aromas of roast lamb and fish filled the warming air. The wine, the wine was wonderful, selected by the groom's family. It was plentiful and I might add very satisfying. But then, but then a dreadful thing happened. No one was overdoing it. 
In our tradition, to become drunk, to drink too much is a disgrace. And you are shunned, you are put out of the bridal place. As the steward poured another round, it became obvious, much to the host's embarrassment, that the jugs were empty, all of the stores consumed. Now, it's odd because I could see Mary, Jesus' mother, rushing around. But, but she was a guest. I could see Mary talking with the parents, and they were all looking very, very anxious. And I didn't know then that she had a relationship with the family. Someone said, whispering to me when we realized what was going on, that Mary is a relative and had been asked to help with the reception, just to make sure all of the waiters were doing what they were supposed to do. Mary looked very worried. After all, hospitality is what it's all about for us. We always have to have our homes neat and tidy. We always have to have extra food if we're able in our larder because we never know when someone is going to knock at our door. We have to greet them with water so that there is enough water to wash hands and feet, not only to wash the dirt off, but between each course of our meal. We must have food to put out and wine to put out, and we must stop what we are working at and offer the best of hospitality. That is what we are expected to do. It was then that I noticed Mary rushing towards a man. Now this man's back was to me, and I wasn't sure who it was until I heard him speak. And it was him. It was him. It was Jesus. I hadn't seen him arrive as I was sitting near the very front of the ceremony. But now that I think of it, there was a bit of a kerfuffle, maybe 10 minutes or so before when the ceremony was supposed to start. Some guests had arrived. It, it almost sounded as if they were unexpected, and, and maybe more than one or two, maybe, maybe five or six. And they were newcomers. And, and as they settled at the back, you could tell that there was a, a disquieted silence among the guests who could see who had arrived. I thought it was just, you know, that, that time when, when people are a little bit nervous, you know, the, the groom's up there, is the bride going to arrive? Why is she late? You know that feeling. You know, I, I, I knew that Jesus was in the area, and I knew that everybody would have received an invitation. But there had been just so much talk, so much talk about what was going on with Jesus. I worried about Mary. Mary was so worried about her children. Would her daughters find the right men to marry? Would the sons find meaningful work? And Jesus, Jesus just seemed to be content to stay at home, to learn about things to do with carpentry, and to, to look after things in the household. So Mary was very, very concerned. And there had been so much talk. John, John down at the river, baptizing people, telling people that they needed to confess their sins and people who had done wrong were coming to be consecrated so that they could go again into the temple and associate with other people. But John had started talking about things that we needed to be fearful of and a person who was going to come who was not going to baptize with water but with the Holy Spirit. We shook our heads and wondered what was happening in John's head. And we were worried. And one morning at the well, the story was all over about Jesus going to John to be baptized. And there had been conversation about what was going to go on, and then Jesus had been baptized by John. And the Spirit... Something had happened again that nobody could explain at the well that day, but something had happened, and the Spirit seemed to have descended upon Jesus, Mary's son, the carpenter. I still really don't understand it. 
And then the stories about Jesus walking, walking away from home, down by the water. And he was talking to people and talking to them in a way that no one had ever really talked to them before. It said that John and two of his disciples were, were standing on the street one day, and as Jesus walked by, John cried out, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And his disciples were startled, wondering what this was all about. And John said to his disciples, if you want to follow him, go. Andrew, without without any hesitation, and, and one of the other of John's disciples began to walk with Jesus and spent the day with him talking. And Andrew got so excited, he went to his brother. He went to Simon and said, Simon, you have to know about this man. He might be the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And Simon came and met Jesus. And and for some reason, Jesus decided that his name should be changed to Cephas, to Peter, the rock. I, I really don't understand. And then Jesus met, what was his name? Um, Philip. Philip. He met Philip. And, and again, there was a conversation. And Philip said, my God, you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, come and see. Come and follow me. And then Philip was so excited, he went and told Nathaniel, And he said, Nathaniel, you have to come and meet this man. He's going to change our lives. Let us follow him. And so they came to the wedding. Those five disciples and Jesus, they came to the wedding. And you know, none of this is like Jesus' behavior. I mean, Jesus was always at home. The only time he seemed to get lost or or, or leave was when that, that one time when we were returning from Jerusalem from the temple in Jerusalem and and we were all in this big journey together going back home and no one could find Jesus. What was he? Maybe 10 or 11 or 12 years old and we couldn't find Jesus. And after a frantic search, his mother and father, Mary and Joseph, found him at the temple in Jerusalem talking to the elders, sharing knowledge that no 10 or 11 year old should have. And then he returned to his home. Oh, I hardly know what to say. It's been such an extraordinary time in our lives. Oh, yes, but back to the wedding, back to the wedding. It was Mary who approached Jesus. They have no more wine, she said to him. By this time, I had moved from my assigned table slightly closer, finding a need for another suite from the table. And I heard it myself, I heard it myself, Jesus replying with the utmost respect. Good woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not come. Mary seemed unfazed. Addressing the troubled servants, she said, do whatever he tells you. Jesus and the servants She was rushing to deal with some children who were playing around the table on which the cake was. And so I settled into my chair and began chatting with another guest, keeping my eye on what was going on in the corner. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons, you know, big, big jars. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then Jesus told them, now draw out some out and take it to the masters of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water. But he wanted to know where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew where this drink had come from. Then the master of the banquet called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine later, after the guests have already had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. I almost held my breath, expecting a berating of the caterers. Unfortunately, unfortunately, 
The men went behind the side of the building to continue their conversation, and I was not able to hear what happened. But I do know that what happened after that, the servants brought out new jugs of wine, the taste of which remains the most memorable of all. By the grace of God, the common water was changed to the extraordinary, the ordinary made extraordinary. What's next? What's next with this Jesus? Will the blind see? Will the lame walk? Will demons be cast out? What's next? Change water into wine. But what does this mean to me? What does it mean to me? Could it be that, that this miracle is a way of God helping me to understand that there is always enough for all of us. It's always enough for me. The very best is still there for me. Is this really about unending grace and forgiveness? Abundant forgiveness. And, and why am I boring all of you with all of this? Hmm. Jesus chose a time of celebration amidst friends and strangers to do something extraordinary. Jesus told, took something ordinary like water and changed it into a life-giving gift of wine that we could all partake of. Just think, regardless of our ordinary lives, we too can become something extraordinary because of God's love. Jesus didn't do this to, to bring attention to himself, but as a sign to point to God's promise to always be with us. The promise of new beginnings, of transformation, of hope and peace in our lives. But it's more than that, isn't it? I think this story helps us to realize that that we can take it as a story, but we are to live this. That the abundance that we receive as people of faith is to be shared lavishly with others. In what we do, in what we say, there is the power to transform not just ourselves, but others around us. Well, I may not have six stone water jugs to share with other people, I have my time and my talents and my treasures. I have the hope that I know through Jesus Christ. And may I, from this place, willingly sharing it as the wine was shared at the wedding in Cana. Amen. Oh, yeah.
knowing that God transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary, let us give as we are able as a response to globally, locally, and the needs within this community. Let us give as we are able as we present our morning offering. Let us pray. God of light, we are one, called to be your children. We have been illumined by the glory of your presence and enlightened by the word of your grace. We see and have become radiant with your love. We dedicate these gifts and ourselves for service in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us come before God in prayer. Wonderful God, ever-present, you bring light into the world where there is darkness. 
and transformed lives with your hope and love. You have given us Jesus, empowered by your Spirit, called your beloved child. May our hearts, minds, and wills follow in his way, guided as your children. Caring God, bring your light to bear on our world in need, to those who live in fear, poverty, oppression, in situations of violence or abuse, for those who have too little and for those who have too much. For your word, which has created the Church and this community of faith, we praise you. We praise you for the United Church of Canada, the emerging work and witness of churches within Sogging Shores. We pray for residents of the Southampton Care Centre in our worship together this afternoon, and for this community of faith and plans underway for next week's annual meeting, we pray and give thanks. As your children, we pray for one another, for the ill, the grieving, caregivers, those with physical infirmities, and others who are struggling with mental or emotional challenges. Knowing we are one, we pray for those whom we love and those who love us. By name, we pray for Mike, Rita, Wayne, Kathy, Brenda, Jane and family, Yitka, and others whom we name in the silence of our hearts. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Loving God, we pray for our young people about to enter exams in secondary school for their safekeeping. And loving God, we pray for ourselves. May we remember that we are beloved children of God, that God sees in us possibilities that we ourselves cannot see or imagine. We pray through Jesus who is among us and within us, teaching us, guiding us as we strive to be beloved living in the light. Amen. Um, announcements this morning. I think John uh, is going to make an announcement for us. He's special. That's why he gets to do it. Yes. Um, John Van Berlo, Chair of Council. First of all, uh, next week, as Reverend Bonnie has said, we do have our annual congregational meeting, so please mark that on your calendar. And also, uh, if you are interested in being a member on council, there are positions open and we would love to have you get involved. And some other news and very good news, uh, after our congregational meeting last week, uh, we were able to get our request on the agenda for region on Wednesday, they had an executive meeting and Region has approved the vacancy for a new minister. So that is now going to be advertised and uh, we can begin our search. So that's very good news and I'm very pleased. We've had a lot of help from both Region and the uh, regional liaison people. So we're getting lots of help from the rest of the church to get our advertisement out there. So I'm very pleased with that. Thank you. John, could you just wait just a moment? Um, as you've heard, next week, the annual meeting. Uh, unfortunately, John has made other plans for that day. He's getting on an airplane. Anyway, I won't go any further than that. But I just want to um, give a formal thank you to John Van Berlo for his guidance and leadership as the chairperson of Port Elgin United Church. And I also want to thank Laura, who's not here, but Laura has been our uh, very much a part of our Christian Education Committee, and she is stepping a little bit back to concentrate on her Sunday school class and uh, the WOW group. So, John, thank you so much for your hard work, your dedication, and uh, just showing the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, you can do one, one. <laughs> it's a new year and we only have one bag of bears left. Tomorrow morning we're going to be stuffing, so I hope you can take a few hours and join us. Well, there's a, a lot of different discussions and laughs and so on around the table 
and we stuff a number of beers. So if you can join us, please do. We meet about 9 o'clock. We'd love to see you. Also, there are um, hard copies of the annual report um, outside in the Welcome Centre. They have been sent out electronically. If you're able to uh, look at it on uh, electronically, that would be appreciated. If there are not enough hard copies today, uh, the church office will be printing more this week and we'll make sure they're available. And uh, we just ask you to read them. Uh, the uh, annual financial report for the youth group has an error in it, which we will correct. And uh, any other errors or omissions, please bring them to our attention. And uh, not that we ever make mistakes. No, 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 no. But uh, anyway, we, we hope to do our very best. And thank you to all the committee chairs and others who have made information available. Let us stand and sing together Camo Font. God. May we take the light of Christ into our community and along the country roads. May we make God's love presence known in love, in word and in sacrament, in places where we live and work and play. For we are loved by God, guided by Jesus, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, this day and always, living in light. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>